million to almost 75 million people are pushed below the poverty line because of the costs of health care. And that is a fact that is well documented. It is also true that cost inflations that are natural year on year will affect health care as well. And we are at such a time when there is global inflation and it is going to translate into the costs of healthcare as well. All this is because there is an increasing dimensionality of healthcare as a business. In fact, it is more commonly referred to as health industry, not health service. And that may partly be the reason why the costs are climbing uncontrollably. I want to tell you two stories. This is a true story uh, about a man who was admitted in our hospital many years ago who had consumed about 15 ml of a very fatal pesticide. And he came in a state of shock. He was treated in our hospital for almost 30 to 45 days. And uh, he survived, although he had a tracheostomy and was a shadow of his own self. When he recovered and was ready to be discharged, he was given a bill which was almost uh, two lakhs. He looked at the bill, looked at his relatives and said this, please give me that same pesticide again because it is for reasons of poverty that I consumed the first while in the first place. It's a story that's loaded with the reality that we face. There are many people who get frustrated with the cost of healthcare as it's positioning itself at the current point in time. We also know of the story of a seven-year-old boy who had dengue and could not find access to four major hospitals in a metro a couple of years back. And he died, following which the shock was so intense that his parents jumped off from the seventh floor of a nearby building to their death as well. Affordability is the key question that we are addressing. It's good to know that we have almost 1.4 crores of people. And uh, we are a young nation with 50% of our population below 25 years. Longevity has improved from 36 point something years at the time of independence to 70 years, which speaks highly of the healthcare reserve that we have developed over all these years. Unfortunately, out-of-pocket expenses for healthcare range from 68% to 75%, and it's one of the highest in the world. 1.3% of GDP, which is committed to the public expenditure of healthcare, is one of the lowest in the world, but there is a promise of that escalating to 2.5 shortly. In the healthcare ecosystem, 58% of uh, healthcare institutions are privately owned and house about 81% of doctors. There's a huge skew there, as you can see. 70% of urban and 63% of rural households depend on private care. And 55 million, as I said, are pushed into poverty every year. This is from the Public Health Foundation of India data. If we look at uh, health insurance, uh, from the 2021 statistics, about 514 million people are covered. The overall penetration has improved over the decade from about 15% to 35%. Uh, the direct premium that insurance companies have earned have been significant, 470 billion. Uh, but we still have about 64% of out-of-pocket expenses as we speak. And this is from a source called Statistics 2022. So what is the downside of self-payment? It is this, that most people find the cost of hospitalization unbearable. So unbearable that they have to sell their assets, they have to incur a lot of debts, which themselves become very unmanageable as they move on in their life. We can see this from large hospitals, where in the surrounding vicinity, there'll be dime a dozen pawnbrokers who uh, make a quick money out of desperate patients who sell their assets, their ornaments, etc., to meet the cost of healthcare that is just down the road. 
In the process of not being able to afford, there's also a neglect of uh, routine checkups, which everybody must do. They miss certain NCDs and serious diseases like cancer and land up paying more as the disease unfolds itself in them at a later date. There's also terrible drug compliance. People don't buy medicines if they are expensive and they come to you with uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes. This is also the reason why people subscribe to alternate therapy, including quackery. As we move from cities to urban areas, they find that quackery brings them some relief, at least psychologically, or as a placebo effect at a much cheaper cost. And undoubtedly, they're, they're, they are willing to take the risks of uh, quality compromises because they just don't have the money. Now, what are these costs? And I bring you some collated figures which I've drawn from the net. An ICU bed will cost anyone in a decent hospital from 30,000 to 50,000 rupees per day. Bed and nursing and the basic care. This is not inclusive of gadgetry like uh, ventilators and dialysis machines and support systems. It will cost much more. As an example, the cost of one of the most popular ICU drugs or, you know, big hospital antibiotics, which is meropenem, will range from about 6,000 to 12,000 rupees a day for about 10 days if a full course is taken. And that is often more than the lifetime savings of a patient. A delivery will cost between 50,000 to 115,000, depending on the city and the type of hospital. The cost of three vessel stenting may vary from five to 12 lakhs. Bypass surgery, six lakhs. Ventilator may cost you 5,500 rupees a day. This gives you a picture of how bad it can be if an unfortunate patient has a combination of all these requirements. He's had a bypass surgery and is on a ventilator in an ICU for 10 days with an infection. Surely we can understand why cost escalation becomes a big disincentive for the delivery and acceptance of healthcare. There are various systems that uh, support subsidies or various systems that we must understand. Public hospitals, which offer free treatment, but are grossly underpowered in terms of uh, equipment, uh, availability of drugs, so on and so forth. There are state-sponsored subsidies, which are state-bound, and they are also free, but they have their limitations as to what indications are, have been approved and accredited. The insurance in general has very poor penetration, about 35%. And it has become essentially a package that is favorable to the upper class who can afford the blue ribbon premium for ancillary cover, etc. Private care, actually with the insurance, caters to only about 5% of the Indian population must say that PNJ or the universal health coverage under the leadership of our Prime Minister has made uh, rapid inroads into offering a central government sponsored uh, security for health. It is improving and the latest version has actually become more inclusive, more generous, and it's certainly a very promising, very broad-based work in progress, and this we must note as maybe the game changer for uh, insurance as we speak. What are the things that actually cause uh, these uh, cost escalations? It is clear that the real estate costs matter, the infrastructure or the capital expenditure that the investor has put in, the hospital builder has put in, the type of manpower and the huge manpower cost salaries and uh, you know all the other allowances for doctors, nurses, et cetera, the type of equipment that is uh, within the hospital, the range and type of consumables, whether they are imported or uh, Indian. And of course, the huge taxes, uh, not one, but many taxes that play around the healthcare ecosystem. All these contribute and converge onto the plate of a cost burden for the care provider. And of course, not to mention, uh, often not realized enough, the huge costs of software and healthcare updation on a year-to-year -year basis or a two-year basis on new patches and new versions where the old one becomes obsolete and 
uh, one is forced to absorb all those costs and that gets translated onto the patient. Let's talk about real estate. Now I'm giving you a picture which probably doesn't exist in India, but this is the modern suite for the rich and the famous. A hospital room which actually beats the standards of a seven-star hotel. And this comes with a cost. And this contributes in its lower forms also to the high cost of care because this is capital expenditure, which is made on the whims and fancies of the investors and those who are looking at healthcare as a business. There are also other things that shoot up the cost. The adoption of certain technologies like electronic medical records and the PAC system is not cheap. It comes with a price. There's an upfront price, there is an operational cost, there are updations and maintenance costs, which also becomes very significant. There are license costs and annual maintenance, which keeps on escalating every year. The requirements of the quality movement, which is good in principle, but if you look deep down, you will find that a lot of quality movements have become mutually inclusive with just adoption of new technology. You need sensors for every refrigerator. You need uh, you know, a certain type of air conditioning. You need cameras at every 30 feet. Whether these things are really required for good health care is questionable, but this is the way quality requirements are putting cost burdens on the institutions. The new norms of air conditioning and power management and uninterrupted power supplies all comes with the cost. And I say this from having been the person who has dealt, dealt on this in my own hospital a couple of years ago. The new bed management systems, security systems, alert systems, safety systems, which are all software based, comes with a huge price. Just to give you some clinical uh, things of what escalates cost, the high-end antibiotics, uh, which uh, people are very easy to get on to any infection in the hospital, you meropenem or levofloxacin or some of those costly antibiotics without ascertaining the logic of whether it is really needed for the patient. Oxygen, most people don't realize, is a very expensive drug. One of the most expensive drugs that we can think of if you use it at four liters per ox per day for eight hours, it shoots up the cost of care. The prescription of vitamins and tonics and protein supplements, which occupy a high emotional uh, position in the patient's mind, psychological dependence, comes with a price. It's often not required for an otherwise healthy person. The overuse of ranitidine and uh, you know, drugs like omeprazole and esmoprazole, which I find every alternate patient is being given without rhyme or reason. It's become standard private practice is also something. And I'm just giving you two examples of uh, injudicious usage of drugs. The use of statins for mild uh, cholesterol elevations, the use of statins as preventive, as promotive, as curative, all these things do not stand to the test of evidence. Use of high-cost antihypertensives are really not justified because low-cost generics do just as good, in my opinion, as a clinician, as the high-end at three times to seven times the cost. And of course, a rampant use of painkillers, which are OTC products, will also get coupled onto this list of uh, drugs. There is a brand affinity. Uh, most doctors are indoctrinated to believe that High cost, high multinational brands are the best. Generics are of no use. There's not entire truth in that. Some generics made by good local companies are just as good. And I think this is a practice philosophy that one has to consider seriously in cost cutting measures. We also know of this uh, evidence-based movement of changing baselines which uh, keeps on reducing the baseline level of laboratory tests so that more and more fall into the abnormal bracket. Cholesterol is one such example, lipid profile, sugars. Now, these are all meeting evidence. But there was a time when 140 LDL was not required to be treated with a statin because there was no statin. And the mortality 
with statin therapy to bring down LDL to 70 does not stand to reason as far as overall morbidity and mortality is concerned. Similarly, there are changing guidelines on diseases like obstructive sleep apnea. They're very quick to advise CPAP. But there was a time when such technology was not available. I'm not really sure whether it has really changed the number of people who have died with this particular syndrome. New technology like robotics, cardiac CT imaging and CPAP, as I mentioned, the quality criteria which keeps changing. And of course, we saw as a, as a good example of the confusion of various drugs playing in the minds of people and doctors during the COVID pandemic. There was remdesivir, there was steroids, there was uh, um, molnupiravir, and so many drugs that were used at huge costs. It was sold in black and it created a hype. Finally, we know that none of those drugs had any value at all, or if it had, it had value on very small niches of patients. So this is the reality and what's, what's the way forward? Before we spell the way forward, we must understand that now the patient is in the middle of an ecosystem where there is an enlarged or an enhanced circle of stakeholders surrounding each one claiming to be a, a care provider. The hospitals, the insurance agencies, the device manufacturers, IT and software, health technology, equipment manufacturers, and pharma. Undoubtedly, they are contributing to the enhancement of healthcare. There's no doubt about that. However, at what cost? Is it justified who's regulating, optimizing the contributions of each to see whether that patient in the middle is frightened, is trusting of the entire system that claims to offer excellence in healthcare? I want to refer to an article that I read in Harvard Business Review. It's an excellent article written by two Indians, which compared the Indian hospitals in the US. And it highlighted the plus points of the Indian health ecosystem. The hub and spoke uh, asset utility, the customized innovations, the relatively low salaries in, compared to the West. The, uh, the use of uh, frugality is not the right word I would use. I have quoted verbatim, but asserting austerity there's a difference between the two. The austere way of practicing a patient-friendly healthcare system is what was complemented. And of course, a volume-based economy because we are a highly populous nation. So I would suggest in five principles of, uh, of adopting when we look at the way forward. One is to build appropriate infrastructure. There's no need to build five-star hotel type of hospitals, but hospitals must be roomy, well aerated, and now with air conditioning being a cause of illness, not a remedy, we've got to relook at the entire architectural design of hospitals. There are lots and lots of healthcare infrastructure which can be bettered by clever architectural refurbishing to make it roomy, to make it less air conditions. We can better the available facilities. You can, uh, you must. Uh, harness adequate manpower, which is of two types, productive and non-productive. The non-productive cohort of people who man the hospital system must be of high quality, high caliber clinicians who use their brains and their clinical sense of decision making for treating patients. And buying appropriate, that word is important, appropriate technology. I will describe that in a minute. And of course, to be constantly cognizant of the affordability gaps and to bridge the two as the journey of healthcare continues. Specifically, we must curb on these, the infrastructure capex, which includes which part of the city you want to buy land, what is the type of design that you're going to use, who's going to be your architect, who's the builder, and is there going to be a basement is it backed by investors? Remember that investors are investors. The endpoints are very clear as far as they are concerned. And that has an impact on how you function. So one must be very careful when we create the health ecosystem. And that is why government and nonprofits 
have got a better capex load than the other type of healthcare system. Manpower must be productive, as I mentioned. Equipment must be the best, not the latest. The latest, it's a myth if we believe that the latest technology is the best technology, not in healthcare. You may always find that what you use is just as good. So if there is a cost-cutting culture, it must be evaluated by a special group to see, is it really needed? Is, it, is the latest the best? Or the best is just a little before the latest is an important thing to consider. Consumables must be acquired or stored by a principle of volume. Bulk purchases so that the cost per unit comes down and use the principle of economy of scale in its purchase. The revenue model should be low margin per patient, but with that low margin, the volumes will just go up because it's just a matter of time before we'll be known as a affordable, friendly ecosystem and people will flock in. The proof of this pudding is if you visit Western Medical College Vellore to see that we don't have the best infrastructure, we don't have the best parking slots, but it's just logged with people because it is a low margin, high volume ecosystem. And of course, we must learn this strategy of how do we curb or reduce overheads in the system, whether it's manpower or equipment or sundry expenses, over, overheads cause a hemorrhage of revenue in any hospital. Hospitals must be like this, not exactly like this, but the concept of being airy and roomy and well ventilated without necessarily having chandeliers on the roof and carpets on the floor. This is just an example. Or in a general ward, it could be very simple and very dignified and very healthy as this, using natural resources for light and air. This doesn't look great, but this is a treatment room. And I can assure you that this is just as healthy and will meet all the quality standards at one-fifth the cost of a more posh, five-star looking treatment room. So there are other principles which uh, must be adopted. There are three or four hours. Let me go through that with you. The one first thing is the principle of reducing medical wastage. The injudicious, generous splurging of consumables by junior doctors, nurses, you know, put on your scrubs, you put on your, uh, you know, take your mask off, go out, throw it off. Uh, use of uh, hand scrubs, maybe soap and water is just as good. It is expensive to buy those hand scrubs. If you buy them, you will know. Clinicians must learn to refrain from thoughtless over-investigation over-diagnosis, over-imaging, and over-treatment. Over-investigation will lead to over-diagnosis. It will also lead to over-imaging because imaging is not so easy. Does every gallbladder stone need removal on an executive health checkup? I'm not too sure, but it does increase the cost of care. And of course, the over-treatment that is a consequence of that. This will not sell in the West. But in India, we've always done reuse, recycle, not everything. But you can have protocols for the reuse and re recycling of equipment that can be scientifically reused. And that must be done with due diligence protocols. Finally, it must tailor therapy to patient's need and pocket. This is a very important principle. If one of the first questions we must ask when the treatment is pronounced to the patient is, look, how much can you actually afford for your heart treatment? Tell me honestly. We don't want you to sell your animals at home, your cows or your buffaloes. We don't want to sell your house, your property. What is it that you can afford without becoming a pauper in the process of becoming healthy? very important question and that will tell you how you as a clinician must tailor the treatment accordingly so that you send him within the true definition of health absence of disease and wellness which is not just physical but mental emotional and financial i would add 
in the adoption of technology, you don't have to be the first mover. Something comes up, you know, we want to be the first to acquire that. Not necessarily, be a smart mover, wait for some time to see whether that technology is good. Don't believe in startups, but go for time-tested technology, which has been tested out on the field and it's shown to be effective. <clears throat> the technology must be both clinician and patient friendly. It must have its benefits outweigh the risks of that technology. And of course, it must be cost effective because if it's not cost effective, the technology is no good. If a technology has to be useful, it has to be cost effective. I would ask the following questions if I have to prescribe a new drug or order an investigation or adopt a new technology. Does the patient need this drug, investigation, technology, app, device? Second question is, does the patient need this now? He has an executive checkup, we found something. If it's urgent, yes. But can his gallstone, which is two millimeters, hang in there in that gallbladder? Is a question, the answer may be yes, but it's a question that every clinician must ask. Third, can the patient afford it easily? This has to be given respect, due respect that if I can't afford it, just like we all take what we can afford when we go to buy something, the same principle must apply. And it's a myth if we believe that if it's not costly, it's no good treatment at all. Finally, will it change my decision to treat him? Will it change his course of life, quality of life and health for himself and his family? The truth is this, that healthcare is stretched to its extreme limits. We all have friends and relatives who have been through ICUs during the COVID time, before and after the COVID time. And we must honestly confess that healthcare is stretched to its extreme limits as far as costs are concerned. Health business is growing at a CAGR of 22%. But I'm sorry to say that healthcare is not. Because if you go to a hospital and see the misery, feel it, palpate it, it is certainly telling us that the pool of disease, the burden of disease is only growing. And we must respond to that as a very responsible fraternity of caregivers. Healthcare can be delivered at 50% of current costs. I'm not giving you an off the cuff there are calculations that show that if we use judicious clinical decision-making, keep away unnecessary technology, keep away all the bells and whistles, we can cut the costs of healthcare, healthcare to 50% of the costs. Healthcare is no longer a primary domain of doctors. We need a large circle of enablers, surely but it needs to reinstate the primacy of doctors as far as the future policy making, the future design of healthcare is concerned, is my humble submission. Because healthcare is turning out to be a good measure of economic prosperity. And that is the reason why in many countries, post COVID, the entire budgeting dynamic of those governments has changed, bringing health of its people on center stage. That's because healthcare denotes economic prosperity. Finally, I must say that healthcare must be three things. It must be accessible, it must be affordable, and it must also be affable. No patient should get scared of the hospital. No patient should say, I do not want to go back to that doctor or to that hospital. There must be a relationship that will be attractive for the patient to come back to the same ecosystem if he is forced to move in his future years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chandi. Um, it was, uh, as always, a pleasure listening to you. I think very rightly made certain points. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you. Do we take those? Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, you did talk about uh, affordability. 
So I would want to know about health insurance and how does that play a role here? Also the role of pharmaceutical companies to support this entire healthcare domain. Yeah, so, you know, healthcare insur health insurance, as I mentioned, has grown from a penetration of 10%, I think a decade ago, to about 35%. I'm talking about private, um, private health insurance, which you buy, which I think is a tremendous stride. And uh, I'm uh, privy to the knowledge that the insure health insurance companies are actually making a genuine effort to optimize the care and the cost benefits and the uh, reimbursement to make it patient friendly. So that's commendable, that there is a move towards um, bringing the patient as the beneficiary and not the hospital or, you know, the care providing ecosystem. And I have no doubt that with uh, more and more health insurance uh, uh, group companies coming in, it will become more competitive and more popular people will uh, subscribe to these uh, health insurance. That's on one side. On the other side, I know in Tamil Nadu, the state health insurance has been a big boon. Uh, I have seen people get benefited by a low cost angioplasty, which they could not afford, which the state has very generously given. It's a amazing formula that they have come out with, which has benefited, but you know, it is a corpus it will drain out at some point in time. There is no recovery of that amount. So while it's very generous, I'm not sure how sustainable it is on a 20-year time scale. And as I mentioned, the PMJ Ayushman Bharat is actually a sponsored insurance scheme, which I think started with its teething problem, but it's gaining critical mass and it's becoming powerful. And I'm sure that it will penetrate uh, deep down into the urban and uh, suburban areas, even rural areas of our country. So there's everything to smile about as far as uh, health insurance is concerned, because there is a changed sentiment that it's uh, beginning to be very patient friendly and very patient oriented. So that's commendable. Okay. A pharma, I am. I honestly am not uh, very sure to um, speak very authoritatively. But I know the concept is that they now are extending a what do you call a kind of corporate social burden to also be partners in the you know the illness segment of that. Uh, what are its? What is the vision behind it? I honestly do not know, so I don't want to comment. But. If it is to actually do what the health insurance people are doing, it's commendable. And I think more and more companies must come out to you know, create healthcare ecosystems or uh, create uh, uh, pathway subsidies or pill boxes or whatever it might be. So that's a good thing. Okay. Um, moving ahead, uh, my next question is, so I have a question that I have received from the audience. Dr. Sudhir Pathak wants to know that how to improve healthcare services in rural areas. So he's asking for directly for Punjab, where infrastructure is adequate, but uh, lacks in trained human resources and its deployment, and which is disproportionate. Yeah, so this is actually a very common question, and uh, it's a global problem. Human medical human, human resource is the biggest constraint of enhancing healthcare all over the world. It's not just in India. We saw that uh, unfurl itself during the COVID pandemic. <clears throat> and post-COVID, there are at least five reasons why the crisis has become worse. Partly because of a COVID phobia, partly because, you know, there's a migration of people. <clears throat> they don't want to get into intensive care areas, etc. So Punjab is no different from UP, which is no different from Bihar. Now, the question is, <clears throat> why is it that doctors don't want to work in rural areas? There are genuine reasons. It is logistic difficulty. It is about, <clears throat> where do I go for my own medical care? If I have a heart attack or an injury, what about if they have children, where do they go? Which school do they go? What about the payout compensations? So these are structural problems of the, the way it's panned out. Whereas in a city, it's a self-giving, self-generating system. 
you work, you get a good salary, your lifestyle is good, children are taken care of. This is something that the government must address. I feel that anyone who works in a rural area must get a higher compensation. You try that and you will see there'll be a flood of people who will want to work. Create schools for children or crashes for children or create subsidies for children who can go to boardings nearby. Give them a vehicle, improve their quality of life. Why wouldn't they want to work in a more serene, tranquil, better aerated, better environment, beautiful part of the country? And that's the experience in Australia and that's in UK. Most people want to work in the country because their life is good. That's not the case <clears throat> as far as we are concerned. So there is a necessity to change the entire environment. And then you see a magic will happen. Thank you so much. I think very rightly answered. And I hope, Dr. Patak, your answer, I hope you were satisfied with that answer. Uh, moving ahead, sir, I would want to know about government health policies, especially about where where do we see universal health coverage as a possibility in India and where are we lacking currently? Yeah, so, you know, universal health coverage, as, as much as I understand, is a, is a uh, offshoot of what started off uh, or an enhancement of Aishman Bharat. And they have built on the old, uh, you know, RSBY, Rashtriya Swasti Bhima Yojana, which was, uh, you know, yeah, a few years ago. So, you know, it has it is like a fruit that is maturing and... Uh, by 2030, they have spelled out a vision to align with the sustainable development goals, you know, which is again a universal uh, need which has been mandated for all countries. <clears throat> now, I know that uh, Aishman Bharat was offering about 5 lakhs uh, for every in-hospital major event. Uh, I think it still, it still is the same or it has probably been enhanced, but I think the highlight of uh, the universal health coverage is that it now covers 40% of the vulnerable population, which is a huge proportion of people. And there is a 20,000 rupees, which is allotted for each episode. And the out-of-pocket expenses, which they have found, and that's true, comes mainly for outpatient care. From outpatient care, which most insurance groups or policies don't cover. I think UHC now is beginning to cover, which will make a huge difference because, you know, two-thirds of anybody's problem is outpatients. So for common ailments and for two, three-day fevers or for the initial start of therapy, that amount is, uh, is pretty good. And the government is also already or is aiming to create 1.5 lakh sub-centers and, you know, special clinics and things like that. So they are ramping up <clears throat> the entire uh, healthcare ecosystem and uh, it will definitely have its uh, positive effect. If uh, I'm, there'll be lots and lots of small hospitals that will get impaneled. And as long as the, uh, the biggest roadblock for any government program is the bureaucracy, you know, the turning over of reimbursements and, you know, impaneled hospitals putting in their money. So if those things are streamlined, it will probably be a phenomenally good uh, program which actually meets the demand, especially from of the semi-urban and uh, rural health care. Thank you so much. Um, now brings me to a very important question, and I think uh, we have been discussing this uh, to and fro, but how do you see that the pandemic has taught us regarding in terms of quality of health care and it's, you know, the management that you see in the country? I think the pandemic has taught us a lot. And I so, think you know, I agree. Really yeah, it has actually exposed the you know, that uh, if you ask me what is it that I have noticed, one is that you know our primary and secondary levels of care, uh, there's a long road to calling it robust. Uh, that is what broke down. We realized that there is no primary care or not enough primary and secondary health care. And the learning from that is personally, I feel that the effort of the government or the private sector, whoever, must be to ramp up that. And it's not tertiary care. Tertiary care must grow. It will grow because tertiary care stakeholders are in a more advantageous position. But the 
the hinterland of India, which was badly affected by lack of mobility, lack of access, lack of infrastructure, you know, was the biggest uh, victim of the COVID pandemic. So that's the biggest learning that it has to, we have to change our focus from tertiary to secondary, sub-tertiary, secondary, and one. Second is that we need to network care. It's, uh, it's not good to have a fragmented system, whether it's private, there must be a networking of private, public, NGO. I, it's only on functionality. I'm not talking about structural integration, okay. but the networking of capacity, if one specialist is not there, we must have a ready system that uh, cross connections so that if one IC is full, there is a willingness to take because ultimately we are all part of the same uh, system. So that's the second thing that we found that networking supply chain uh, was very poor in terms of transporting material, equipment, the capacity to generate oxygen. All these things have had a band-aid uh, you know, recovery, but I'm not too sure whether there's any depth in it because everybody's gone back to their old uh, systems. So there has to be a renewed energy put into integration and making it like a blanket of primary, secondary, and tertiary care throughout the country with the individual state machineries that are operational from state to state. Uh, very rightly said. And I think that also you've done a talk on the primary care, that how it is a solution to the healthcare crisis in India. So I mm. think if you would want to state something from that lecture, I think that would also be great. If you would have anything to say from that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the truth is that primary care, although it is very basic, is the most difficult layer of care because it is more spread out. It cannot be reduced into a edifice, which is vertical. It is more horizontal than tertiary care. It is about somebody going out there into the villages, into the needy areas, and meeting those the demands that are mainly preventive. Uh, so that preventive concept, again, is difficult because a large amount of preventive, come, preventive approach comes from your own orientation of your health and illness. Correct. So if I'm not motivated that I must check my cholesterol, you can give me any number of uh, interventions, but I will not buy it. So that's actually getting into the culture of that belt of people or that cohort of that population, which means you need people, you need counselors, you need primary health workers, you need uh, local language interpreters. So you see how labor intensive it gets and it's very flat, it's on the ground. But it is doable provided it is decentralized. Okay. You know, it is, uh, it, it cannot be done by, you know, a yeah, hub in the yeah. center. Correct. Correct. It has to be decentralized, it has to be localized, you know, it has to be culturalized. So if you do that, and that's happening in some states, but uh, the more you do that, the easier it will be to change the culture. Actually, COVID induced a primary health consciousness in our country. You see from the number of people who are wearing masks, you ask them why, they're not sure, but they were... They now even now people wear masks because it's now become part of a habit. You see, that was a, a, a tragedy that induced that, but it actually demonstrates the capacity of of an event or a uh, social behavior initiative to induce a change. So, as nurses and medical people. We must become more serious, evangelize the gospel of primary health care. That's the way to do it. Thank you so much. I think you actually answered my next question also. It was more of a comment. I would want to, just to wrap up this session, I was wanting to you to give me some few uh, takeaway points which our audience who's watching us live here would definitely would wish to remember going forward. Yeah, so, you know, I don't know how many people are watching, but uh, uh, a forum like Docplex uh, can be a catalyst, you know, because of your reach. It's online, it is uh, free. Um, it, rather than, 
just be a forum for uh, you know view exchange it, it can become a a forum for knowledge exchange and uh, group initiatives you know so there is a need to to revive that spirit of uh, again networking uh, what is it that you know a group of doctors in let's say nagpur can do uh, for any need there may be a local need there it might be primary care it might be road act road traffic accident management or it might be an epidemic of malaria or whatever it might be i'm just giving uh, you know stray examples so there is a need to uh, be conscious and conscious you know you pick up a problem the forum provides you about 50 people who are like minded okay you get to initiative for it so like special groups you know like uh, uh, traders and uh, slum dwellers whoever it might be there are so many things that can be done. and that must find support from companies from corporates you know it is time to stop putting money into things that are visible it's time to put money into things that are invisible and healthcare is one such thing so i think all corporates must get into healthcare as a serious priority in different ways it's not to build hospitals but you can get into primary care you can get into secondary care you can just provide ecg machines you know a thousand ecg machines to a rural setup or in an area that is impoverished it makes a difference okay so like that uh, this forums like docplexes and there are many other forums uh, are catalysts in this uh, movement which doesn't exist till now but my take home message is that that young people must get into how do we harness the energy which lies you know just be a forum where you see and forget it but can we take it to the next level and create an impact thank you so much sir and i think on this positive note i would like to close today's session and thank you so much dr chandi for being such an expert here also guiding us towards the entire discussion here and to uh, agreeing to participate uh, on top lexus webinars we would love to host you again sometime very very soon pleasure and always a pleasure i used to be a member but you know because of busy uh, work uh, <laughs> no we we would love to have you engage with our audience even even more through our different offerings not just webinars um so hoping to see you uh, soon again on top texas thank you very good evening thank you thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so thank you. thank you so much to our dear audience know. as well yeah thank you so much sir.